I think we can start and um, other people who will join us would be absolutely welcome to do. Good afternoon, everyone. Fantastic to be with you this afternoon. Uh, and together with my uh, good friend, Stefan Osdell from the Interpol's Innovation Center, we will be moderating this uh, panel on trust and security, building trust for use of AI for law enforcement. Uh, my name is Irak Liberidze. I'm head of uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics for United Nations uh, Interregional Crime and uh, Research Justice uh, Crime and Justice Research Institute, uh, based in The Hague in the Netherlands. Right? Uh, we have a very long history of cooperation now with uh, Interpol, and we a couple of years ago started. Uh, a very unique platform on use of AI for law enforcement, risks and benefits uh, related to this technology, related to policing, related to crime prevention, criminal justice, rule of law, and ethical application. And uh, our first um, global summit, which we uh, co-hosted together at the Innovation Center in, um, in Singapore in 2018, brought together uh, many representatives from the law enforcement agencies where we started to examine how this technology can be used by criminals, uh, how this technology can be used by law enforcement, and how to make sure that uh, we will drive all the benefits out of it and minimize the risks which are associated to that. Uh, latest, um, uh, latest global event, global meeting which we uh, held was also held in Singapore in uh, just a couple of months ago in July where we had uh, more representatives from different countries, more uh, experts, uh, private sector, academia, and uh, others to contribute in this debate. Uh, and the main essence of uh, these discussions are to ensure, uh, to ensure that benefits are actually extracted from this technology, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and there, that, that's why we are sort of co-hosting uh, many different events globally. We have done an informative event at the headquarters of the United Nations in New York, with 150 representatives um, of the countries were briefed about the cooperation and the platform together with, uh, with Interpol. And we are planning to uh, co-host another global meeting that will be a third edition of that next summer in The Hague in the Netherlands, where we are aiming at drafting already some principles and best practices uh, how AI could be used by law enforcement. Uh, just a few, uh, few introductory words. Artificial intelligence has definitely entered our life on many different aspects, which been discussed at this summit as well. And Estonians then done a fantastic job of organizing this digital summit, and I can tell you frankly that I attend many different events, I speak at many different events and moderate panels on many different events. This is one of the top and best uh, organized and best addressed uh, substantially as well as logistically summit I've ever been. So thank you to the uh, Estonian government. Uh, now, uh, uh, AI has entered many aspects of our life, uh, whether it's a healthcare, transportation, energy or others. And uh, uh, law enforcement agencies also started to examine how this technology could be beneficial to ensure safety and security for us. Although it came slightly uh, slightly later, but uh, but the threat itself has been accelerating, and there has been a number of examples. And and one of them, for example, last month there was an uh, there was a situation when the uh, using machine learning techniques, uh, voice was uh, manipulated, and, um, and the company's uh, financial director was asked by a CEO of a fake CEO to transfer uh, a sizable amount to an uh, unknown uh, account where this transaction took place, and, uh, and criminal act has been performed, probably one of the first uh, AI-based cyber attack uh, if we can qualify. So apart from the uh, digital threats, which is uh, certainly will be accelerated by the um, application of AI driven technologies, we have two other threats, a physical one with use of uh, autonomous robotics or autonomous drones. And for example, last week's attack in Saudi Arabia on the Saudi oil facility is demonstrating how vulnerable our critical infrastructure is and how much that type of technology can be used for for, for to 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 cause uh, to cause harm. Uh, certainly, we are not entering any political discussions why and how it happened, but the mere fact that uh, technologically this is possible and advancements in technology will enable uh, criminals or terrorists to use that type of technology on cri critical infrastructure is certainly noteworthy. 
Another aspect and another threat is uh, related to the political threats, where we see a lot of uh, manipulated video, uh, videos, for example, and, uh, and capabilities, how this could be used for uh, manipulating elections, for example, or other political processes. And this is certainly possible, and this is certainly dangerous, and this is something that we need to be taking uh, account of. Um, apart from the threat, uh, and if this was the only issue that uh, the AI would cause, uh, pose only threat, we would simply ban this technology and we would not be discussing it. But certainly not. This uh, technology has many positive uh, aspects, including in policing, including for the law enforcement agencies. And we have examined many of these examples, which I hope that you can also bring up a lot of these type of examples. That brings sort of a both sides of the story, and therefore it is very, very important to address the issue which is at hand for us, building trust of communities, of countries, of people for the use of AI by, by law enforcement, to make sure that people understand what are the benefits and to see that how we can use that for beneficial use. So uh, without going too far uh, uh, and, and, and speaking too much, I'll hand it to my co-moderator, Stefan Osdell. Thank you, Irakli, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, for uh, the next 75 minutes or so, uh, we will divide our discussion into three dimensions. Uh, first, we will address the topic of malicious and misuse of AI. We will discuss how AI expand the scale um, uh, and ca can further complicate the attribution of specific attacks. Um, and how it can, uh, as I said, ex expand the scale and efficiency of crimes. Uh, the next, next topics, uh, we will discuss the widespread of uh, AI in law enforcement. Uh, we will discuss several AI technologies, uh, domains that have been tested and even implemented in law enforcement. And we will also address popular use of AI in law enforcement, as well as areas that are still a little bit underexposed. Um, third, we will discuss on the why and how law enforcement build trust in the adoption of this emerging technology. In partic particular, uh, we will clarify the concerns and controversy surrounding the use of AI in law enforcement, such as the black box problem in AI decision making, bias in algorithms, and probably also over expectation of what AI can do for law enforcement. And together with us, we have some distinguished panelists. And uh, let me introduce you, uh, you to those. Um, on my left side, we have Ms. Natalie Smua, a lawyer and assistant lecturer and, researchers, uh, and researcher from the Faculty of Law uh, in the University of Leuven. Uh, and she was also previous coordinator of the uh, uh, European Commission high-level expert group. Um, and on my uh, right side, uh, Dr. Bente Skatter uh, from uh, the Oslo Police Di uh, District of Norway. She's a senior advisor ICT and also project leader uh, uh, for the Oslo non-intrusive surveillance project. You will probably say a little bit more of that afterwards. Yes, and Dr. Eleanor Hobley. Uh, she's a head of research in big data and project leader for recommender systems within cities. Uh, cities, Germany, and, and that you probably know that the central office of information technology in the security sector in Germany. And also we have more distinguished panelists, but unfortunately I don't have you, you guys in my, my notes, so could I kindly ask you to introduce yourself, starting with Marianne from Denmark. Yes, of course. Uh, my name is Marianne. Uh, I come from uh, Denmark. I work in the Agency for Digitization, which is a part of the Ministry of Finance in Denmark. We work with digitization issues that goes across the level of uh, the government, uh, municipalities, uh, regions, and the central government, and also with the issues that goes across uh, different ministries and government. So, for example, we have the responsibility together with the Minister for Defense for uh, the strategy on uh, cyber security and information security. 
Okay. Uh, my name is Rob de Wert. I'm head of uh, department within the Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom Relations in the Netherlands. Um, we work on the information society, various topics from digital inclusion on the one hand, innovation projects, uh, but also the question of uh, information security indeed for our government uh, across all uh, kind of organizations uh, we have. So, and, and we also contribute to our national AI strategy from a public value point of, uh, point of view. And hello, my name is Joseph Carson. I am a cybersecurity scientist and working in the application of artificial intelligence and AI in cybersecurity threat intelligence. I'm based here in Estonia, um, though I do represent Ireland and uh, do a lot of advisory around the world in the application of artificial intelligence and the use of automation and advanced automation to really understand about things around attribution intelligence from cyber attacks. So hopefully it'll be an interesting discussion and we can find ways to use uh, AI ethically in when it comes to cyber attacks. Yeah, my name is Günter Krings. I'm one of the parliamentary state secretaries in the German Home Affairs Ministry or Ministry of Interior Building and Community, as our long name is. Uh, uh, part of my portfolio is digital administration, cyber security, but also general security and constitutional matters. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a fantastic group of people, and I think we should dive in into the question. I'm really happy we are, uh, from our center side, we're cooperating very closely with the Netherlands police, also with other uh, stakeholders, and looking forward to engaging in this dialogue with you and continuing this after, the, after this panel discussion as well. Let's jump into the first question, is that how real is the threat? Is it, is it real threat? Is it something that AI has been or e will be used... Um, in a very, very foreseeable future, or it is already being used by criminals or not, and I want to sort of open up, and one sort of housekeeping is that, let's keep it as a sort of a brainstorming session, uh, and fairly informal, if somebody from the audience has a question or comment, please raise your hand and you will jump in, but please allow our uh, panelists also to respond um, as a sort of a priority. So, who wants to, who wants to come in with the, with the first response to that? How real is the threat? I can comment on that. The threat is real, though we sometimes come with different various definitions of reality about really what artificial intelligence is. Uh, throughout the day, you've probably heard different opinions and different definitions. And the problem is that, yes, AI is somewhat, you know, this is more the science fiction future term. When we get into the reality today, what we're really talking about is assisted intelligence. It's automation. It's advanced automation. It's augmented intelligence. When we talk about the different realms and different applications that's been used. But in my industry, where I've been focusing around the cybersecurity threats, is that advanced automation and augmented intelligence has been used by criminals for many years. Uh, they do communicate quite frequently. They do share better than sometimes governments and, and countries and citizens and companies who are looking to defend. So they do have a collaboration that is much more aggressive in order to uh, create more intelligent, more advanced types of threats and attacks. So I think that, yes, the threat is there. It has been used. Uh, specifically around, you've probably seen more intelligent types of phishing campaigns that's been going on, where it's actually almost very difficult to now tell the difference between a authentic email that's coming in versus something that is abusive. And if you see those algorithms and those types of techniques that's been used, the threat is there. And what we really need to do is find a way that we can come collaborative, collaborative together, work together to find out ways to mitigate and reduce that some of its education, some of its technology. Uh, thanks a lot, Joseph. I mean, I understand the threat is there, but can we give some like a real, real examples of how AI has been used by criminals? Because we've been struggling in, like I understand that, okay, we have different definitions of AI and I'm not going to get into the how to define AI at this stage. I mean, to me, the AI is a mimicry of our cognitive abilities of solving problems or, uh, uh, so uh, do we have a real examples? Like Bente, you are um, from the, uh, uh, real law enforcement police organization, Oslo. How do you evaluate that? In, in Norway, I don't think I have seen any real um, evidence that it is due to the AI, use of AI, but we know, I've at least read from, from foreign countries that they have deep fakes, where they actually uh, do criminality in order to, to fake the pictures and movies, uh, which is uh, not good at all, because it has a sexual flavor. So uh, deep fakes, we know, uh, has been, um, been. but uh, we should expect that also the criminals, because they are really innovative, they are creative, 
and they are also uh, mean, <laughs> so they should, and they probably also have a good bunch of money sometimes in order to go for the tax. So, uh, but they maybe are doing more to camouflage it yet. But cyber attacks, I reckon they are quite much on uh, using artificial intelligence without being in, uh, very good in that. Uh, so. Uh, th no, th th thanks so a lot. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I fully agree. I, what I yeah. defined in the beginning that all the digital, physical, or political threats are there, and we've seen all the evidence that this is being or will be used. But yeah, that's what I was trying to extract. That yes, that but we are at the cusp probably that it will sort of as a tsunami will come and start challenging your uh, organizations more and more in that sense. Uh, Rob, you wanted to comment on something? Uh, it's just an anecdote. Um, a few days ago on the national news on Sunday at 8 o'clock, uh, a large portion of the nation watches that. A reporter just uh, made a good example of a movie of our prime minister, and he moved his mouth, the reporter, and the prime minister spoke the words in his own voice as the prime minister. Uh, he was assisted with the professor, etc. This is, uh, the projection was that in a few months, this was available on smartphones in apps, and you have the apps where you can put your face in, an, in a movie scene or something, which is in China now used, very, very popular. So it's not only can it be used by uh, criminals, uh, this technology, and what would the effect be. It's also for our democracy, for um, uh, the politicians, but even in the evidence, um, uh, uh, well, uh, perception, uh, when, when you try to uh, prove a case, um, there, there can be a different defense as well. So I think this is really a development. It won't be there at once and in uh, large numbers maybe, but it will go fast. And I do think that our policing and other organizations should prepare. And, and I don't know if we already have the answers, but we should work with scientists and others to at least try and stay a little bit ahead, uh, or at least in the front of knowing if it's real or not, et cetera. Uh, so that's really, um, um, I don't know if we can have an example today, but uh, I'm sure tomorrow we will. Fully agree with you, and this is the type of stakeholder cooperation which, uh, together with Interpol, we are promoting and bringing together all the, or most of the law enforcement agencies to share their experience, start the concrete projects, and some of them has been kicked off at last our last meeting in July, where a number of uh, police, including the Netherlands, actually, they concluded an agreement with the Australian police, and they started a very innovative project on that. Uh, anyone else wanted to comment? Yes, Eleanor? Uh, yeah, just briefly, so com computer-generated content or manipulated content is truly a threat, and um, there's a research project in Germany which was launched, I think, three years ago called Ananas, so pineapple, um, <laughs> which is looking at trying to detect morphed um, passport photos. Yeah. And you can actually do this reliably if you have a, um, a high-resolution digital image, but the issue that we have <laughs> is that Passport photos aren't high-resolution digital images. They're these tiny little photos, uh, and then they get scanned in, and then they get put in your um, passport. And you can't reliably detect morphing um, on these images, even though I think it was the University of Bologna showed that up to eight people can use one passport if you just go on the biometrics of that. So if you morph an image, you actually change the biometric data and then use AI to detect that. The AI is used to morph the image. Um, and so that's a real threat in terms of identity. Um, and I would say it already goes on, but we don't have the systems to detect this reliably. And because we don't have those systems, we can't make reliable statements about how frequent misuse or abuse of AI systems in that case are. So I think um, looking at computer-generated content where image analysis is already very far, far advanced, um, but not just image, we should be looking at text and audio too, we really need to be on top of detecting manipulated and generated content from computers. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely that uh, you sort of uh, also proposing some of the solutions because of if, if not, if you're not detecting these occurrences, I mean, we would not know and we don't maybe know how much has been used and what should be done. Natalie wanted to comment also. Yeah, I just maybe wanted to add, that, you know, I, I can't give a concrete example, but I think there are issues that we can already anticipate by the few examples that we did already here, like the deep fakes, like the drone attack. Um, I think that, first of all, the fact that these crimes will be able to be perpetrated on a much larger scale, potentially. There will be a much bigger issue in tracking these crimes and identifying these crimes, and that is also an issue with that technology. 
and then also to actually apply the law and enforce it, if you cannot detect it, will be another major challenge. And finally, then allocating responsibility to the actual person who is the perpetrator behind it. So all of these issues we can already anticipate, even if we don't, you know, if we're not aware of the widespread use of that, it might be still under the radar, but this is something that we already need to prepare for, like others said. And, you know, I think the, the, the collaboration that you've set up, the exchange of information between enforcement agencies makes perfect sense, um, but also perhaps the allocation of more resources because that is, as always, the difficulty with law enforcement in order to conduct further research into what possibilities there are and foresee potential misuses, and then especially finding solutions, also technical solutions, as to how this can be tracked and how we can not just prevent that from happening, but if we know that it's under the radar, how can we identify those crimes and then enforce uh, the laws? Actually, has, uh, have proposed a number of interesting initiatives, which uh, we should definitely be looking into it. This is kind of a next question, what actions should be taken from our side? You've proposed resource allocation, co collaboration, and some of the identification techniques, which is uh, extremely important, especially resource allocation and collaboration on international level. Anyone wants to add before we sort of end this, this session? And Stephanie, no, I, I to probably just can add to the question that we have within Interpol done um, small survey uh, amongst our uh, member countries and ask them for real examples um, and we didn't get too many replies for, for, from our member countries and we ask ourselves why uh, other than the obvious one that's really known to the media there could be explanation why don't they don't share this information with us uh, I don't know but but so far, we are struggling a little bit to have these real good examples to, to, to build uh, our information system on, actually. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, maybe just one more aspect, because I think, it, of course, it's very important with the, the technical systems and, and also with the law enforcement and the ability to find out who, who has done this or that. But the other part is that I think we should really also very much look into uh, the competences and the knowledge uh, among uh, the citizens and uh, uh, businesses, uh, because I think they have sort of like uh, digital has been something that we have a very high level of trust in and it's been sort of like a safe journey in, in many ways uh, but now we have a sort of like increased uh, cyber security threat and, and stuff like that and what we can see at least in Denmark is that the level of competences in dealing and detecting these things and knowing if uh, if, if there's a threat or not is, uh, is not very high and it's very simple measures that we don't take in order to protect ourselves uh, so I think that's a very important aspect as well. Fully agree. Uh, thanks a lot. I think that we had a quite a, a vibrant discussion about how real the threat is and uh, about the malicious use. And I think one of the main conclusions from this portion of our discussion is that we are at the cusp of, of sort of we are very, very close that when we will have more and more of these cases popping up, some probably are happening and we don't know about and we don't have capability of detecting them or fully classifying them as such as AI attacks, but technology is there on the on the digital side, on the political side, or on the physical side, and we already see many occurrences of, uh, or, or many signs of this sort of coming into the daily life, and certainly resource allocation, collaboration, and all uh, different uh, projects which um, on the international level uh, and some of them we would definitely be contributing to and and uh, and uh, creating platforms for facilitation but you also sort of on bilateral level will do will contribute to mitigate such threats now let's move to the different dimension let's move to the sort of a next uh, dimension of our discussions which is the use of ai by law enforcement uh, on the one hand, we have a threat, but on the other hand, the same technology can be used for good and can be used for good for on many, many different things, including uh, contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we have a special forum for that in Geneva AI for Good Summit under ITU, which we are addressing that subject. But in our context, certainly AI, um, uh, this technology is... Uh, is there and uh, police, or, uh, police organizations, uh, law enforcement agencies are already experimenting with some of them. Uh, so let's start discussing how 
this is being used for the law enforcement and how useful it is for real uh, and what sort of results it, it gets. Maybe we can kick off with you, Bente, again. Thank you. Um, in, in Norway, uh, we are we are on we are on the start of using uh, artificial intelligence or algorithm in our uh, tools. Uh, we are using in some cases um, professional tools or systems like Griffi in order to to prevent uh, uh, crimes of uh, child abuse. But also in, within the finance sector, we are using tools. But still, we are very much in the prototype stage. So, but we are looking into different kind of aspects, uh, speech to text, video analysis, object detections. Um, so we are trying to learn more about how to use that, but we are not, we are not in a really good stage at all. Uh, but we are striving for to, to learn more and also to cooperate uh, better with um, many stakeholders which we need to work too closely, especially when, when it comes to policing in smart cities. The police is, uh, we are working together with other partners in order to, to make uh, the city safe. So, uh, so uh, we are in a very steam learning curve. <laughs> so yeah. So, and also, uh, for, uh, also security, of course. I uh, shouldn't forget that we are working in order to use, use uh, to prevent attacks in the police force. Yes, it appears yeah. that I mean, no, uh, what we what we saw in Singapore as well at our meeting, and you were there with us, is that uh, most of the uh, law enforcement agencies are now experimenting with different uh, uh, products and different applications and different solutions, and they believe in that they're investing uh, funds in it, and but this is still in the beginning stage. This is still uh, at the experimental stage where. Uh, um, there is a lot of learning happening from, from that side as well. I would like to give the uh, floor to... A brief, um, more general remark. I think that um, law enforcement for some time has mainly seen, um, um, not AI in specific, but generally IT development as a threat to, to doing your job. Um, so, I mean, if there is a court order under very strict conditions and we have to tap into a phone call, um, it's not an easy procedure, but once we have it, we have actually a duty to do it, but to detect a terrorist plot to go after a, a, a possible, or to, to, to see whether somebody uh, who's convicted of, of or alleged, uh, assumed to be a, a murderer or something, we can get the proof that we need to, to bring to justice. So, and of course, they detected more and more, you know, the headline going dark, that people are smart enough to use um, voice over IP to, uh, to a phone call, not using SMS, but using messenger service and so on. So it was always like on the, mostly at least for them, on, for law enforcement, uh, on the side of, of, a, of a threat of making their work um, uh, more difficult. And that's why I think uh, AI is also a chance to, to also enable law enforcement to um, cope with some of the threats that were also already also caused by IT. So if the communication is encrypted like a messenger service, just to find a way with AI. If you have this court order, of course, to, uh, uh, to go after the content of the communication if it's, if it's necessary. And I think this is a, a great chance. And um, of course, we have to deal, as a, coming from the political level of government, uh, maybe at least already a little bit to the third dimension of our discussion, um, that people on the same time um, Sometimes the same people assume we can't do nothing. We are like very bad in digitization, our, our administration, and so on. But the same people assume that we do all kinds of sinister and, and dark things uh, infringing with our human rights. So they kind of give us credit at the same time for doing nothing and doing everything. And I think that's also very, very important to make sure that there are the strict rules that apply in the analog world or in the world before AI are still applying here. We, in another panel, we discussed the example of facial recognition. Uh, it's clear that you can't put everybody just, it's just of interest for the government into a, such a database, but only perpetrators of, of really um, a ser a serious crimes or people that are really un under, the, um, um, condition, uh, under the suspicion of, of plotting some, some um, really serious act. And um, we also have other chances in, in this area. For example, it's not only facial recognition, it's also action recognition. If you see if somebody's lying on a platform, is he sick, has he had a stroke or so? And so this is like kind of an equivalent and, 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 and a substitute for, for real human beings being around. Police people or people looking after a platform, seeing how people, uh, is there anybody in, in need of help? So I think if we make it clear, but in general, the same standards apply, of course, then the difference is, is still there 
that it's a new dimension, not of quality, but of quantity. Of course, if you have more and more data, you can do more and more things with it, and then there you have to uh, be, make it very clear to act responsible for this. So this is open to the sheer quantum of, of data um, enables uh, new, uh, new possibilities for law enforcement. But of course, we have to make sure that we only use them in, in reasonable cases, in reasonable circumstances. Yes, thanks a lot. I mean, uh, of course, on the face rec uh, on the face recognition side, we will have um, more uh, comments during the how we build trust because this has been one of the hotly debated subjects. Always, how uh, that this particular technology really proves effective for. Uh, um, law enforcement on many different cases, whether it's a, a counter-terrorism operation or the child abduction case, but at the same time there is a clear uh, problems related to the privacy and clear problems related to the abuse of authorities by the governments. Uh, Natalie wanted to comment on... Uh, yeah, before diving into the sort of third uh, part, taking a bird's eye perspective maybe of your question, I think we see some countries where they're ver at a very much prototype stage, like uh, for instance in Norway, um, where the debate also maybe publicly has not yet developed much because there is just not that much use yet. And then you have those countries where they might be beyond the prototype stage, for instance the UK, where you see that there is now starting to be quite a backlash. Um, there is a societal debate now going on on do we need more statutes in order to you know, regulate better how and when it should be applied. Um, you have countries who just decided not to use it at all. I mean, if we look at the US, for instance, and then you have countries who use it and where there is just not even a possibility to have a debate about whether or not to use it in the first place. Um, so there are different levels of maturity of application of the technology, but also different levels of maturity of the debate, the societal debate around it. And then within that sort of framework, um, there are a lot of gray areas as to which exact applications you want to apply it for. And that is also a very important dimension. It's not because you start using AI systems into your law enforcement program that you do that automatically for all different types of things that you can use it for. You can be selective in that and, and try to apply it for some things and not others. And I think generally the, in discussions like this, we're at the stage where we, we bring this forward and try to see what is the best approach of these different levels of, uh, of maturity. Stefan, you wanted to comment on Yes, that? it brings me over to, to, uh, to, a, to a question I asked myself this morning. With, you know, this uh, keynote speaker this morning talked about taking more risks and be at the forefront and also in, within law enforcement agencies, they, there's a saying that we, the police, need to have the latest tool always be in forefront of, of the technology and so on and so on. But does the statement th this morning uh, really apply for law enforcement? Should we be in the forefront? Should we take those risks as law enforcement agencies? Uh, I would like to hear your comments on that. Um, I've been working with uh, innovation for, for many years in the business market uh, and uh, taking risks comes with the territory. Um, I, some companies even celebrate their mistakes, but I think that will be hard to do within the police force, uh, actually maybe provoking. So, so we also have a culture issue within the police. Because, uh, because we can, I, I strongly believe that we can do innovation in a more smooth, if you put it towards the research, but when it comes to out in the street or out in the digital space where we actually do operation, we need to be very thorough and very ethical and be very strong and, and good. So, so we have obviously a sincere challenge in, in, in order to, to um, keep up with the speed and also make things happen. Yes, certainly there are areas where, where we are not really allowed to make mistakes, otherwise we would be losing a lot more time in experimenting because there are startups you can sort of uh, be innovative and risky and, and it's your own startup where it's at stake and here it's at stake entire industry or entire sort of uh, communities and countries. Eleanor, you wanted and then... Uh, yeah, uh, okay, sorry. I just, in terms of risk, I think it depends on really the case. You always have to look... Um, at each case individually in law enforcement because every case is individual. Um, so, for example, in Germany, 
AI is starting to be used. Um, if you're all aware of the Panama Papers, the Federal Criminal um, Police actually used AI combined with rule-based systems to help their analysis of 2.6 or 2.8 terabytes worth of data because they had to sort through that amount of data, which is a very large amount of data, and look for only um, files that were relevant to German jurisdiction because obviously, you know, they can't go after people in the Cayman Islands. Um, and in order to do that, they actually have some really good experts who are very knowledgeable in natural language processing and can train models for that particular case so that not some blanket AI algorithm, it is a specifically tailor-made algorithm that is used just for that case. And they can also examine the outputs, look at the context, and then use rule-based mechanisms combined to just narrow down the scope of, of the data that they have to look through because 2.8 terabytes of data is massive. That's not something that humans can, in any reasonable period of time, actually look through. Um, and so that's a fairly low risk case. Um, and they did a really, really good job of it. I think they deserve a ha hats off for it. Um, and then there's, for example, the field of child exploitation material, which is a very high risk um, uh, issue. And I think if you were to say, um, as Microsoft announced this morning, they've got a research program in um, conjunction with North Rhine-Westphalia. They're going to look at using AI to identify and classify uh, child exploitation material. Because that's so high risk, you can actually say, well, well, we need less reliable models in that case. We just want to get as many hits as we can. We will verify all the hits. But if we have some misses, it's not that tragic. Obviously, every single miss is tragic. But it can really ease um, police work on an everyday case-to-case -case basis. So you always have to look at the risks and the gains and the individual case when you're looking at the application of AI within law enforcement agencies. Yeah, absolutely. So just to kind of comment on a few points, there's one that uh, Gunther had mentioned earlier. I think when you mentioned about the volume and uh, the amount of data get, getting gathered, uh, in my um, kind of background and research, it's more about the accuracy. I think it's uh, less data sometimes is better when you've got higher veracity and better accuracy in the data itself. And to go back on, on Stefan's point about should law enforcement be taking risks, I think it comes down to evaluating the impact. Uh, if you evaluate the impact itself, then because we're here talking about trust and if you want to maintain an establishment of trust between society and law enforcement then law enforcement has to be right most of the time and especially in cases where it has high impact so when looking at take risk taking you should always assess the impact itself into whether it's going to impact your stance on trust because the last thing you want to do is degrade trust with society. So that should always be the, the basis of, of the decision making is what's the impact of that risk taking. Um, going back to some of the points that you just mentioned, I think one of the clear things is that absolutely when we look at artificial intelligence, one of the things that I always get into is that we have lots of data. And the challenge we always have is that what's the questions we want to ask it? It's not about what can we do with the data, it's what do we want the value out of it. And I think that's what we really need to get down to, is what's the right questions. Is that data necessary doesn't need to move. We don't need to be sharing data, we just need to come up with agreements about what questions we want to ask. Because I can ask data in different countries the right question and get the information back. It doesn't necessarily mean to have the entire data set. So that's what we really need to get into, is understanding about what are we wanting to achieve and which direction and path we want to go down. And that's hopefully from the trust in the uh, risk taking, hopefully that gives you a bit of uh, industry insights. Yes, certainly. And uh, oh, uh, Natalie and Rob. Yes, yes, you're waiting for a while. So <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Natalie, please. No, no, not a problem. I think there's something that Gunther said in an earlier panel um, that is very important is that if you cannot take the responsibility for it, it might be better not to do it at this stage. So that's maybe a first thing. And that goes together with the fact that. In our you know, uh, democratic societies, law enforcement uh, agencies have a sort of unique position because we give them the monopoly of violence. Um, that means that there are some higher standards there uh, that need to be respected. Uh, and then maybe jumping in on something that Joseph said, a lot of times, because AI is also being hyped, uh, you have this, this stage where 
people say, well, we have this data or we have this thing, what can we do with it? Rather than first asking ourselves, what do we actually want to achieve? What are our priorities for enforcement? Can we go after the big fish rather than using data in order to go after small petty crimes and then perpetuating, for instance, poverty? So AI is not always the best solution for the things that we want to achieve. And we need to, you know, it's chicken and egg, but we need to first identify the priorities that we want to achieve. Yes, thanks a lot, Natalie. I really like your interventions because you always come up with the proposals like prioritization of the data now, and we have all my bullet points for the concluding remarks. You're filling it in there. So, uh, excellent. Uh, Rob, you wanted to say something, and then... Uh... Well, well, yes, in, in effect, this is the question about can a government experiment? Yes, and uh, of course, this is a special sector. You have uh, higher standards, that's true. What you also should do is a good public debate about uh, what is allowed, what is not allowed. Um, and of course, the human-centric AI is debated here all day. Um, the human rights we have are very important. And I do think that in the way you experiment, in the way you put up the sandbox, that should be the first priority. And it's also about how does an organization respond? Is there a, um, an option to protest? Is there something of a feedback loop? And how is society involved in that? And I think that if you include these parts, then the experimenting has, has more um, possibilities. And the second thing is, we should not just experiment, hey, what can this technology do for us? We should have use cases, and these goals will guide us. And then you will build up uh, in what way you want to experiment. So um, I, I, I think that uh, experimentation is important, um, because uh, in the end, uh, the expectations of society are uh, accordingly, uh, that, that also law enforcement should, uh, should experiment, but with boundaries and safeguards, yes. Certainly, yes, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, just, just, uh, yeah. just a comment from my side, and then we'll sort of move into to it as well, is that as far as the use cases, we have been examining a lot of use cases uh, on our uh, platform as well, and on our um, uh, global meetings, and there has been a lot of interesting use cases from different parts of the world as well, and some of them very useful ones. Uh, like Japanese police have uh, come up with some very interesting uh, uh, detection technologies and uh, as well as many others uh, there, which we will be including in our upcoming report, uh, which will be coming out sometimes in October by the uh, Interpol's General Assembly. It would be a joint UN uh, UNICRI um, Interpol report on uh, AI for law enforcement. So uh, please, uh, gentlemen from yeah. Germany. Maybe first remark, it's, I, think, I didn't want to suggest that, that I, I advocate getting more and more data for, for, uh, for its uh, for the purpose in itself. I think it's, it's necessary to withstand the, the temptation that more data is always better, and I don't believe in this uh, famous quote of our American colleague, um, in order to find a needle, you need first a haystack. And that's, that's, uh, if you can have it without a haystack, it's always much better and much easier, and much easier to do. But I think the, the, the question we were, we were discussing here for the last minutes do we have to be forefront or are we not allowed to do this? I think it's a real dilemma. In, in, in one sense, yes, uh, we have to be on the forefront because there's nothing as, uh, as dangerous and, and as terrible as to only prepare for yesterday's attack. Uh, we have to also think of new scenarios, even though unfortunately we're always overtaken by reality, but really what could be the next stage of organized crime, of terrorist attacks, and so on and so on. We have to, we have to look and, and think ahead, of course. On the other hand, the other side of the dilemma is, uh, in, a, in a rule of law system, uh, our legislation has to be narrowly tailored. Just because we can think of a threat, it doesn't mean that we can already um, uh, legislate new powers uh, in this case. So it, it's a, always a, a balancing approach again, also here. And last remark in this, in this context, yes, I, uh, that I think I agree fully with what Natalie said and what uh, you mentioned with the, with the special responsibility of the government. But fortunately, with the special responsibility, there also comes, I believe, maybe a little bit old-fashioned here, also a special sense of, uh, of duty that, that I expect of every government official. And it's actually enforced. You know, uh, I don't want to, uh, since I'm partly also one, I uh, don't want to be rude to any government official, but I think the one thing dearest to them is their pension. It's very generous in Germany, the pension for, for, for government officials. And nobody will risk this just to look into another file where you're not allowed to, uh, to read into it. But unfortunately, we see a tendency, in Germany at least, maybe also beyond, to withhold certain techniques, certain IT tools from government because they might be misused. And I, frankly, even though sometimes it's supported even by our constitutional court, I don't believe in this strategy. I think we have the law as a limit, 
and the law will be obeyed by government officials. And if they don't, all these terrible consequences are there, including losing the pension. So I think we should really trust our legal system that we define what you can do with a certain tool and just not um, shy away from developing tools that, that have a, a reason to be developed. Uh, thanks a lot. I think that we are now smoothly sort of moving into the, our third dimension of discussion, which is the uh, sort of core of uh, what we are here for, is how to build trust in the use of AI for the law enforcement. And let's just spend a few minutes about uh, identifying what are these uh, existing concerns and controversies surrounding this issue. Obviously, there are some really low-hanging fruits, which I hope that you will sort of all identify. But let's go a little bit deeper there. I mean, what are the real concerns? What are these society, how societies are worried about it? And and uh, and later on, we will address what we should do. Be uh, what we should do about it. Eleanor, you want to start off with that? So. I think in Germany I can safely say that there are people who are concerned about Germany be, be, re, uh, regressing to being a surveillance state and that is something that Germany has um, experienced twice now and I, I myself would also be concerned to be living in a surveillance state. So that's not something that Germany wants and it's not something we're wanting to set up and I think I fully support Gunther when he says if we're going to use something like um, facial recognition or biometrics it has to have very narrow and important use cases. So I think that's a really good point that was made. Um, and because Germany has a history of having made some very, very poor decisions politically and gone through some very bad systems, the people in Germany are rightfully, <laughs> yeah, are rightfully concerned about uh, reverting to that. And so when they think of AI, a lot of people think of biometrics and facial recognition, so they view it as a potential threat. Um, and I think if we want to build trust, which is also part of this last dimension, what we have to do is communicate our use cases quite specifically, communicate the limitations that we impose upon ourselves within these use cases, come up with systems that are auditable, that um, essentially can be reviewed so that we can prove that we are doing the right things and say, all right, this is a really limited application that we're going to be using um, and we're doing it for your benefit because we're trying to catch serious criminals or terrorists and not because we're interested in the guy who maybe, I don't know, pickpocketed or something. Uh, uh, minor crimes, well, as, yeah. And those so. do them either. I mean, no, I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to, don't worry, your wallet's <laughs> safe next to me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, I want to ask actually Natalie, she's a, a uh, co-author of the EU's trustworthy AI guidelines and one of the sort of drivers of that process for last year and a half, uh, where EU um, uh, actually drafted very comprehensive guidelines. And maybe Natalie, you can tell us about how e e Europe in general and uh, EU as an institution in particular views these issues and how public they are perceived threats and what is it that we can do about it. Yeah, so the, the guidelines that we developed with the high-level expert group are general or horizontal guidelines. So they don't only apply to uh, AI being used in the law enforcement, but broader. And the idea is that then they are tailored to the specific context or use case in which they are um, applied. And so some of the um, issues spotted there, or rather the issues that these guidelines try to address or tackle, are, for instance, human autonomy. And so one of the, and that is also something that you, when you talk with police forces, um, they also worry, for instance, that once uh, they use AI systems, do, will they still have the leeway not to do what the system recommends them? Because the moment that they don't uh, do that, they will have to justify why they do it differently, and that brings a lot of questions of responsibility. Then there is the black box, uh, the auditability problem, uh, accountability, bias and discrimination uh, is definitely one of them as well. The fact that more generally, uh, when we feed data into an AI system, this is of course past data. So all the biases, all the issues that you have in our society, and we have a lot of them, uh, because there are a lot of human biases and human problems as well, we'll just put them into the AI system. So we, we cannot expect those decisions to be suddenly much better if our society is not, you know, we, we need to make a correction there. So these are some of the issues that then these guidelines try to point out and address. Um, and so this, this is a, a comprehensive mapping of the ethical issues. And maybe going back to the discussion um, that was going on over there, um, yes, what is necessary is uh, a framework 
of ethical and legal dimensions. But in order to be able to trust the law and to say, you know, we have the law and if you trespass the law, no pension for you, we need to make sure that the law is comprehensive enough. Um, and that is, that is one of the things that we are trying to discuss now, are there legal gaps? Uh, and if there are gaps, do we want to fill them with legislation? Do we want to fill them with guidelines? How, how do we go about that? How much leeway do we give? And so that is still a discussion that we need to have. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I, uh, I, we will be sort of picking up on that. But, but prior to our next uh, global meeting in The Hague, I think that all these discussions which we will be ha having will contribute towards that and we'll feed into it before we will draft something what I already sort of informally called the Hague uh, principles of use of AI for the law enforcement. And I think that you would fully support the Hague Sounds principles. Sounds very good. The Hague <laughs> principles. <laughs> Hague yes. principles. Now, before, 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 I, before I give floor, actually, I wanted to ask Bente because she's been sort of um, uh, also asking for the floor. But I want to ask her a specific question about the Norway uh, sort of regarding the uh, intrusive surveillance and your project related to this non-intrusive surveillance surveillance in Oslo and you had some very interesting use case which you explained to us how your project works and how you anonymize the data and uh, all the issues uh, very interesting ones how the best practice which you are using in Norway yeah uh, thank you um, it's actually uh, trying to cope with some of the questions Eleanor mentioned about surveillance and how to cope with that because this is also, at least in Norway, a minefield if you don't do it correctly. And, uh, and we also have to think about the diversity of the citizens because I'm on duty to make Oslo a safe city every day for the citizens. So I need to take care of that. And the citizens, when they are having a huge diversity of understanding how they think it should be, I need to, to, to know more about that. So we need to work with the citizens and uh, we are trying to look into whether we can do anonymization of the data of the surveillance cameras for instance uh, and maybe also sound uh, so it's uh, we are working with that in order to also start to uh, what we are also have seen sorry i'm a little bit eager <laughs> uh, seeing that is uh, to, to work with anonymization it's also open for a better discussion because surveillance is also can be really intrusive so we actually people get stop <laughs> and uh, so it's using these techniques also open for a better discussion so but what i would like to to say uh, iraq is uh, one of the big questions i have in policing in smart cities that i know for sure because we measure this in norway we have uh, high trust when you meet meet the police officer in the street okay 80 percent actually previous year maybe say 79 that's very high so people trust when they meet me in, in blue, for instance. I'm not blue, but uh, if they meet me. So, uh, but in the digital uh, space, we have low trust. It's uh, below 30, and that's. And if it comes to the territory of smart cities, let's imagine this. This is what I actually struggle with because they will merge, and how fast will they merge? And what with the criminality? How will that uh, change? So, so trust is more than uh, just not only on the street, but also in the, in the cyberspace. So I, I'm convinced that they will intervene. And, uh, and if you are low, have low trust in that uh, digital space, and that is taking more power uh, or space, we have problems. So, uh, and, yeah. and core of our debate is that how to build that trust, how yeah. to ensure that, I mean, some of the trust is sort of, which is, yeah, that legitimately, um, uh, there is a legitimate concern or there is a hype or a myth related to that, I mean, to make sure that this is sort of, that the hype is diminished and the reality is portrayed. Uh, if we had slides, I would really show how you anonymize the data, how you put this really beautiful cartoon characters on the head of the uh, of people and uh, faces but but we will do that next time I think, uh, I Joseph, think yeah Joseph uh, let's just ex expand a little bit on what Nelly was mentioned I think it's important that um, you know to build trust it requires multiple areas is one is that you know uh, when we're looking at artificial intelligence and the use and application within law enforcement it's important that the actual law is applicable to everybody there's no exceptions there should not be exceptions because therefore you create this separate classification that is not applicable to certain areas or it's applicable to this. So it has to be applied to everywhere. What's one of the key areas? I think as you mentioned, some of the keynotes and, and the talks today has actually covered a couple of the major important areas is accountability, is that we all have to be accountable for the actions that it actually implies. The other important uh, part is how we communicate it. 
is the communication. A lot of times we actually leave the communication, the message to the end, where it actually should be something that's actually upfront. And going to what Rob had mentioned earlier as well, transparency. It, a lot of the decisions has always been industry passing information to, to government and then it disappears sometimes and we don't hear until later. I think it's important that we have a two-way communication for citizens and government so that we all actually understand transparency about how it's being applied, those specific use cases of how it's actually been adhered to, what the boundaries and limitations are. That's the foundations of building trust. If it's a two-way communication, there's transparency, and also there's ability to actually question it. There's ability to respond that why was those decisions made? What was the outcome? Was there some type of you know, uh, applicableication that you can actually go and, and, and ask for basically transparency? So I think it's important that trust is built. It's not just basically assumed. And that when we're moving down this path, that there has to be cooperation between both citizens, industry, and government in order to make sure that we have a trustworthy system. Yeah, I can, I can, can continue on, on this. Um, I think the question of trust is related to the other question of how proactive can we be, should we be. I'm not sure how many of you know the movie Minority Report. Probably most of us. I actually didn't see it to the whole thing, but the idea was it was very crazy that people get arrested um, for a crime they might do because AI probably has, has told the police this person might develop into a criminal, might do and do this and this crime. So this, of course, uh, is, is a, it's a threat scenario and a terrible scenario for everybody, for all of us. So I think the solution might be, if we want to build trust, to find ways, what you mentioned, to take the trust that the police has and deserves in the physical world. I think even our numbers are even higher in Germany than 80% <laughs> into the digital world. And that means that we have to make the case that what we do digitally is kind of not a new dimension, but it's aiding what we do physically. So the police has more eyes when they have cameras. And these cameras are, it's what, at least what we do if we have, to a very small degree, cameras in public spaces, normally are not just indefinitely recording but there are some police people monitoring this, this, this video screens and they're, it's erased after 24 hours in most cases and so on. So to make sure that it's really an, a, a, a natural um, 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 improvement of, of what you can do physically because you can have um, maybe a policeman at one side of, of a big train station but if you want to also go and see what's, whether there's an um, incident on the other side it's maybe helpful to have a camera there. So I think to, have, to do it really in a, in a sensible and, and not too overbroad broad way. And, and also I, I agree perfectly that there's another dilemma coming up with between secrecy and openness of police. Of course, police don't like that their methods of, of investigations are up, up there in, in, in the open and then criminals can kind of adapt to them. But to, to, as, to, as far as it can be done, responsible police has to be more open. So it's really a balancing approach again. So we can't tell all your secret recipes, of course, <laughs> that would be terrible for police, but to be more open. And sometimes I even argue when you and I go into parliamentary question, question hour with our, with our departments, can't I tell a few things openly to at least ex explain our policies? Because I think we have to explain on a political level, but also to the citizens more than we have maybe have had to do like 50 years ago. And it's, we can't ex you know, give away all the, the methods of, of working, but we have to be more open, as, as open as it's, as it's possible. Eleanor. So uh, talking about trust, we've been talking a lot about how we need to build trust uh, from the citizens or in the citizens in the methods that we use, but there's another dimension to that, and that's that we need um, our law enforcement officers to be able to trust the systems they're using, because in the end they are accountable. Um, we do have human oversight, and I think that's a very important dimension that no decision uh, which has been enabled or supported by an AI system is independent of a human. There's always human oversight. But um, everyone who works with AI knows that AI has associated uncertainties. So sometimes you might get, yeah, 99%, that's this person on a face or this object is a bicycle, and you can easily check that. But with more complex systems, um, for example, natural language processing, where machine semantics differ from human semantics, you can't easily verify that. And yet the human at the end is the one who's accountable. So there is a bit of uncertainty, not just in terms of how our citizens perceive what we're doing in law enforcement, but also in terms of the officers themselves being able to trust that the system they use is sound and that it also will be sound before a court because that's what it comes down to. If we go to a court, 
and want to bring evidence, we need to be able to say, all right, this is how I derived yep. that evidence, this is the path I took to get there, and I'm accountable for this, and this is supportive evidence. And um, when we get positive hits, for example, if you were to detect child um, exploitation material, you can verify that. But you can't verify your misses if you're searching through tens or hundreds of thousands of videos because the reason we're using AI is to try and take down our workload so that it even becomes manageable. Um, so we need to understand that and communicate that not only to society but also to the officers who are interacting with AI systems. Yeah, and, and maybe just adding to that and also coming back to this fear that, that law enforcers have of adopting new ICT technologies is that they are actually in need of some guidelines mm -hmm. as to what they can and cannot do and which processes to follow. And that means not regulating necessarily the technology or the algorithm as such, but rather what are the steps that you need to take in order to minimize as much as possible the risks that we all just discussed. Because once you have this sort of framework, you feel much more secure to operate in that space. And you know then also what the consequences are if you need to assume responsibility. Whereas right now, this question of responsibility and what happens if I don't listen to the AI system, it's out in the open. So. Uh, 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 yes. Briefly saying not just guidelines, but actually it would be great if we could have certification um, so that you can actually go before a court and say, well, this system has been certified, and that's something that, you know, in digital forensics we come up with, certain products have been proven to be effective, so why can't we do that for our AI systems? Certification would be great. Yeah, just an additional to, to some of the topics we're discussing. Uh, one of the things I find in, in at least the industry I've been kind of focused around cybersecurity is we tend to talk more about our failures. Uh, and we tend to have that as the main focus point and tends to be the one that's grabbed by the media all the time. We also need to talk more about our successes. We need to talk about where we've done well, where we've stopped and prevented uh, crimes from happening. And we don't tend to do that well because we tend to want to keep it you know, within the boundaries. Uh, so we do need in this industry to, to build trust as well, is we need to talk more about the successes when we prevented crimes, when we actually mitigated uh, you know, criminal activities from happening. That's what will build your trust as well, when people know the system's working and it's actually benefiting society. Certainly the success stories always motivate and always provide extra incentives to do more and uh, I fully agree that we can do things step by step as well, creating principles after that, creating guidelines and uh, going deep dive into it and creating certifications also which would be extremely useful as well uh, and that's what we are intending to do from our side as well and uh, our uh, Dutch colleague fully supported the Hague principles which I like the sound of it as well. Um, we don't have too much time, I want to open the floor for the audience as well and then we will have time for the panelists also to come in and uh, make their conclude, concluding uh, remarks or anything else what they are uh, have so we have I don't see this side so I see a lady over there do we have a microphone maybe we can hand in oh yes and please introduce yourself before asking a question so we know who you are. Sure. My name is Dr. Salma Abbasi from the eWorldwide Group. I was on this morning's panel of AI and law. I think one of the most important things, uh, I, I agree with everything that people are saying now, but there's two points. N number one is that trust has to be earned. We can't build trust. And so how do we do that? We actually have to work with community and as, as I think the, the colleague said earlier that there's only so much information that can be shared but as much as possible if we pick and I like Elena the benign crimes um, it, it's much more easier for us to disclose this information as law enforcement agencies at a community level to start earning the trust i.e. if we pick topics of um, child exploitation, sexual harassment and uh, and then we move in the direction of the violent crimes. In England, we have an issue of gang crimes, and it's a growing number. But what we're using technology for with the, let's say, the, the home office is to map where the crimes are occurring. But as we take that data and share it back with the communities, then they begin to feel the trust that, okay, this is going to help us be proactive and save the lives of our kids. That positive thread helps build the trust, I think. 
Well, thanks a lot. Uh, you wanted to comment? or? Uh I think that's a really interesting observation because in Germany we've had the other reaction. So uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, and in, in fact I think there are now six German uh, states which use predictive policing geographically, so not in terms of profiling, but geographically where do we think a crime's going to occur to optimise resource allocation. And that's what it is. Yeah? It's just saying how do we need to deploy our officers so that we can manage them best to hopefully manage crime or prevent crime. Crime. I personally believe that's a really, really good use of AI, and I like that. But people started complaining about the fact that if that knowledge becomes public, then you'll look at a, a, a suburb and say, oh, that's where all the crime occurs. I'm not going to buy my house there so that house prices drop. <laughs> yeah, it's great how we map everything back to the value of housing. Um, so it's interesting that in England you have a trust building, whereas in Germany the same technology application actually led to distrust. Or, yeah. Well, I, I, I hope we're keeping Germany secure too, yeah. But um, it's just the perception, yeah. So. The mapping information has to be secure. Yeah. Actually, just come I mean, being originally from Northern Ireland, when you have those types of scenarios, what happens is you end up having people self police themselves. So you always have to be careful by the use of information and how you share it. Otherwise, what you do is take, force people into making their own decisions and their own taking things into their own hands. So it's really important to do it with you know, uh, understanding about the potential impact. Um, so you have to make wise decisions in those scenarios. Was there one more question down there? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is George Ziralis. I run an early stage venture capital fund out of Athens, Greece. Uh, and I have the following question for you. Uh, in the private sector in the industry, uh, typically when it comes to AI and cybersecurity companies, the most challenging things, thing has to do with talent, how we, we attract, maintain, educate with the latest trends and technologies uh, the people that work, that work for our companies. Are your organizations uh, facing similar challenges and how, how do, you, uh, you know, do you go after them? Who wants to take that question first? Eleanor? Um, so at CETAS we're really, really lucky because we're a very new federal agency, um, so we're two years old and we have various incentive programs which are more flexible than traditional civil servants would get. Um, we support master's students, we have bachelor's students and um, work experience students with us, we can also support PhDs, um, and as Gunther mentioned, Germany has a very nice pension program. <laughs> <laughs> which I am hopefully one day going to be a recipient of if it's still around. Um, so there are incentives. Yes, you don't earn as much money as in the private sector, um, and we need to train people, even if they have a university degree. Yeah? I still need to give them context and train them up on what it is that they're going to be doing within our organisation. But um, finding applicants at the moment hasn't been too difficult for us. Starting out two years back, I think it was more, but now we've become quite attractive and people find it really interesting, so they, and they want to help. They really do want to help society, and we're there to help. Yeah? We're trying to protect society, so we're kind of lucky. Okay, and then Marie. Yeah, I think um, what you're saying is, an, it is a big challenge for a lot of governmental agencies, not just law enforcement, to attract talent. Uh, and not all governments have a, you know, attractive pension like Germany. In Belgium, it's not sexy at all, for instance, to work for the government. Um, but I think something that Eleanor said, and I agree, especially the younger generation, they, they want to also do something good. They don't necessarily, not just the younger generation, but you see this tendency more in that generation. They want to do something meaningful. Um, and I think they're coming back to something that Joseph said earlier, PR is very important and in Europe we are way too modest. We, we don't have this PR culture of going to broadcast also all the good things uh, that we manage to do. Uh, all the challenging things that we can do with this technology and that's maybe something we need to work on. Yes, uh, definitely because there are many of these cases and there are many interesting uh, aspects which could be highlighted and, 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 the, and the more incentives would be built. I think we have time for an at least one more question from the audience. Uh, I'm, I don't see the, this side. I hope I'm not missing anyone. If I'm missing, please just shout it out. Uh, gentlemen. Hi. Uh, my name is Sachin. I studied uh, cryptography long back here in Estonia. So that's my Estonian connection, but I'm in India. 
and uh, one of the thing uh, i mean your session was interesting so that brought me here but one of the thing that i was thinking building on his question that to do innovation let's say with stakeholders like you i think uh, very first challenge is having the right data so for example just to give you a practical example i think department of homeland security in us has funded lot of uh, companies in last one or two years so one of the problem statement is x ray machines that we have in the airport right so in india the biggest bottleneck to go through a airport is the human looking at the x ray screen and i think ai can do a very good job and i believe i can solve that problem but i don't have access to that data which is you know in that x ray machine so if uh, you know agencies like you could come up with a challenge program like what department of homeland security is doing in us i think that can uh, solve problems much faster just a comment if you can share if you are doing such things here in europe uh, definitely i fully agree that uh, transparency on that level is very important and the engagement of the wider spectrum of, of sp stakeholders is extremely important as well from our side what we're trying to engage as many stakeholders as possible in our dialogues together with interpol and other agencies as well and uh, certainly uh, sort of sharing information is very important as well and uh, please yes you comment if if there are any my yeah yeah i think i think uh, i think you are very uh, you're pointing out a very important issue that we have to be able to work uh, better together uh, between the public sector and also small private companies and also in the public sector at least in europe be able to give up problems instead of solutions uh, because normally we have these large scale tenders where we put up uh, solutions that we want to have it in that and that way and it's not very innovative and uh, i think we should instead put out uh, our um, our challenges and uh, let more uh, not only small scale companies but also uh, people from universities from research uh, and help us with our challenges in the public sector and uh, in denmark we're just trying to do that in in a very small scale right now sort of like a, call it a govtech program but uh, i think i think we'll see more of that in the, in the years to come I can, it, uh, just a quick remark um, 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 because i'm looking at the watch now but but interpol is, is currently building a collaboration platform where we can communicate with industry academia and law enforcement agencies where we can uh, actually the law enforcement can 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 uh, submit uh, problem statements so, so we can have uh, a place to, to, to communicate and uh, we're providing this um, in the next two years probably. Uh, we've been launching this platform, but I can uh, give you more the details about yeah. that. So can I just have a quick comment? So uh, thank you for giving your valuable insights. I was in Sweden, uh, you know, earlier this year and one of the public hospital innovation manager was saying that they have data in health context and they can use that data to buy AI tools, right? And he was saying, I need to change the law somehow that I can do public procurement with data. So I think when you start thinking hard about data, so data is your asset, data is your currency. And if you are public agencies and you want to, you know, uh, stimulate innovation, all of a sudden that data also becomes money, you know, not in the money way, but, you know, Let's quickly, and then we need to conclude, so I will make a... I would just like to comment on the fact that in the law enforcement context, we have to be really, really, really careful which data sets we give out to the private sector. Because if you know anything about AI, you know that the, pretty much one of the biggest things is GANs, so generative adversarial networks, which attack models that you know. Now, if I hand out my data, I'm giving you the ability to create the model that I created, because if you optimize correctly, we'll come up with the same solution, more or less, which means that you can then come up with a GAN, which will attack my model. And I'm not going to do that. There is no way I'm going to give out my data to the private sector, which would make it vulnerable to attack, because one of the requirements is that we have resilient, robust systems. And I think if there's any sector where we need resiliency and robustness, it's the law enforcement sector. So I'm sorry <laughs> to dampen your um, desire to obtain data from law enforcement, but we have to be really careful about it. On the other hand, when it comes to ideas, challenges, I think they're a great idea. We are trying to um, implement that within our organization. We don't yet have the guidelines that enable that, um, but 
certainly in the research section, <laughs> we're working towards it and we've made proposals, but you know, they have to go through due process and be approved. I'm hopeful that we'll get there. Uh, thank you so, so much. I think that we're going to conclude now. We had a fascinating discussion. I think that uh, after this one hour and 25 minutes, we are all wiser and we have matured even more and, and the debate has, has become sort of elevated on another level as well. And, uh, and this information which has been exchanged uh, within this short amount of time has, it will be very useful in uh, you know, translated, translating into a very concrete actions. Right, right, in conclusion, what I would like to invite our panelists uh, is in one or two words, just, just one or two words to say, what are these concrete actions we should take to earn or to build to trust for the use of AI by law enforcement? And you can volunteer who wants to go first because others can think about this one or two action points. What are these action points? Rob, you want to say or first? Certainly, we, we should take human rights as a, a focal point. Uh, we should um, take these uh, human-centered AI concepts and translate them into system principles. Human and rights that. and human centric AI. Uh, yeah, but, but translate that into system principles together with the community. System. Because that really builds trust together with a big debate. Okay, thank you. One or two words. Rakhli, I know you are um, really ambassador for AI for good. And uh, what we have not discussed or mentioned here today, I think, is actually we could also, because police also um, not only fight criminality, but we also try to self and he help vulnerable people. So, so we are working with scenarios that we actually would like to use at, uh, future techniques in order to help vulnerable people, uh, because that will also build trust. Because that is also our part of our uh, of our, uh, of our duty. <laughs> so yes. Help vulnerable people. Help vulnerable people, Eleanor. I think we need to look at the whole life cycle of AI and its implementation in potential um, law enforcement and ensure that we build resilient, robust systems, that we're transparent about the use cases that we use them for, that they are auditable so that we can prove that we have accountability. And that's a really good way to ensure that communities will trust us with what we're doing. Martin? Uh, maybe just adding, being being good at communi communicating and showing the good use cases and good examples. I think that's extremely important. Okay, so if there are two things that I need to limit myself to as action points, I think first of all it's education um, within the police force, so educating them about the possibilities of the AI systems and then the risks that go along with it, but also the broader public. And then secondly, um, taking these AI ethics guidelines uh, that we created and now tailor them, apply them to the different use cases in law enforcement and really map out what does that mean concretely for an AI system in law enforcement. Absolutely. I think some of the key thing for me is that we should not fear AI. We should embrace it, but with responsibility. Uh, and that's one of the key things that we have to embrace it with responsibility and use it to the greater good. Um, but to some of the points that's made, I think it's really important that one is that we focus on the prioritizations. We all collaborate together to agree on what is the right, what are, what's the right questions to ask in order, what is the, what the value we want to get out of it. And at the same time, I agree that communication of the success is one of the key factors to actually making and building trust. Uh, thank you so much. I think we had a, again, fascinating discussion. We have discussed uh, many issues related to the, how real the threat is, how law enforcement is using and how law enforcement has the potential to use it, how to earn and build the, build the trust and how important it is to, um, to, to build principles and based on the principles build, build more concrete guidelines and, and uh, even certifications. How Eleanor used it, we will definitely take this into account in our discussions and debates and and trying to control, we'll try to uh, translate it into concrete actions. So thanks a lot, and let's applaud ourselves, and uh, I welcome uh, debates and discussions after this session.